If you have your Bibles, uh, could you turn over to Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. If we could put that on the screen, please. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. One verse, and all it reads is, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Let's look to the Lord. Our Father in heaven, thank you that we have this privilege where we can come into your house, dear God, and Lord, we just ask that you would settle our hearts. Lord, focus our attention on what you'd have us to know. Help us, dear God, as we talk about this subject of death and judgment, Lord, to, to not to let it escape the fact that you have a way of salvation for us and that we would focus on that. Father, we ask that you would truly meet with us and, Lord, speak to us boldly from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Could I have the video, please? I don't know if anybody recognizes who this is. There we go. But maybe uh, you're familiar with his music. His name is Mr. Bobby Caldwell. And uh, Bobby Caldwell came to light in the 70s with a song called What You Will Do For Love. Uh, a very prolific writer. He's written music for um, you know, many people, Boz Skaggs and uh, Amy Grant, Peter Cetera, um, many other artists, Neil Diamond. Uh, he also has collaborated with many other musicians, um, and I've had the privilege of seeing him on more than one occasion. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Bobby Caldwell. But less than two weeks ago, Bobby had an appointment with God, and he was not late for that appointment. On uh, March 14th, Bobby Caldwell died in his sleep as a stark reminder that everybody who is born into this world will someday die. Mortality is 100%. It's something we simply can't escape. Um, it would be foolhardy to think that for the few minutes we have on this world in comparison to all of eternity, whether it's 50, 60, 70, 90 years, that that is an instant in all of eternity. And it would be foolhardy to think that there is nothing that happens after that. Now, most people have an innate fear of death, and that fear stems from the fact that they're afraid of the unknown. They don't know what's going to happen. And I dare say, if you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you should have fear. But if you know him and you're saved, you have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about at all. So what exactly is physical death? Because that's what we're talking about, physical death. James tells us that physical death is a state where the spirit leads the body. Other uh, popular uh, Bible expositors will tell you that it's a journey where our physical being uh, eventually just returns back to what it was created from, which is dust. You know, the Bible tells us that we're formed from dust. In Genesis 3.19, uh, God tells Adam, he says, uh, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return into the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. That's the fate of our body. To understand exactly the origin of death, we have to understand the origin of life. What's important to remember is that all of us are created by God. And all of us are created in the image of God. Now, what does that mean that we're created in the image of God? It simply means that all of us have some aspects of the very nature of God. Uh, we have spirituality, morality, rationality, love, hate, compassion, mercy, grace, fellowship, friendship, characteristics that are very unique to humanity that we have because of the way we are made. But there's something else in us that depicts how we are made in God's image. And that is the triune nature by which we exist. We know that God is one God, but he manifests himself in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Each human is built with a triune character as well. We have a body, our outward manifestation. This is what God created from the dust of the ground. And when God created it... It was not meant to die. But you know, man also has a soul. 
the soul is the seat of our emotions, if you will, the mind, the intellect. I think it's pretty interesting, you know, when I read about these materialists, those that believe that nothing exists beyond material, they can't explain the conscience, they can't explain emotions. How does a materialist define love? You can't put it in a test tube. How do we explain our emotions? You really can't. Or the mind. The mind isn't the brain. The mind is how you think. And boy, I question the way some minds think. And then, of course, there's the spirit. The spirit is the part of us, in us, that communicates with God. Jesus said it very clearly. He said, God is spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And what he's talking about is the ability to commune and worship God. That only happens when your spirit is alive. It only becomes alive through faith in Jesus Christ. But it's from the spirit that we're able to commune. When God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Edom, he placed them in this perfect environment. And he gave them one warning. You see, there were all kinds of trees that they could eat from over there. And he says, there's only one you can't eat from. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, the day you shall eat from it, you shall surely die. Many people are very critical and say, whoa, what's God, trying to hold something back from people? How many parents have told their kids, I don't want you watching that on TV. I don't want you looking at that in the internet. I don't want you listening to this. You're not going there with your friends. Why, because we're mean? No, because we're trying to protect them. Evil had already existed in our world at the time Adam and Eve was created. Satan had already fallen. And it was God's perspective that he's going to try to shield them from this evil. So he told them, he says, look, that tree will open your eyes into knowing what is good and what is evil. I don't want you to know that, so, so don't eat it. And of course, humans being very curious creatures, they ate it. But something happened at that point. Sin entered in the world. And immediately that spirit that God had given to them, that God had breathed into them, that connected God with Adam and Eve, died. Spiritually, they were dead. And they lost that fellowship and that connection with God. But something else happened that's interesting. Death entered into our bodies. Our bodies, which were never meant to die, then did begin to die. And eventually Adam and Eve's bodies disintegrated, died, and returned to the dust of the earth that they were created. And everybody that's sitting in this room, that's what's probably going to happen to you too. You will die and your bodies will disintegrate into the ground. Just like Mr. Bobby Caldwell over here. The question then comes in, well, well, what happens? What happens after that? You know what's interesting about all this, the story of the Garden of Eden, is that there was a tree also in there called the Tree of Life. And if Adam and Eve had eaten from that Tree of Life, their bodies would have lived eternally but in a sinful state. In Genesis 3.22 we read, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Notice the triune nature or the pluralistic nature by which God defines himself, us. The man, shall be, is, uh, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So what happened was, God cast Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden and said, you can't go back in there anymore because I don't want you going near that tree of life because if you eat from it, you're going to live forever and you're going to live forever in a sinful state. What we refuse to acknowledge at this point is this is an act of grace of God. You see, God allowed death now to exist in our physical bodies to prevent us from living in a, per in a uh, perpetual sinful state. We look at death as some kind of terrible thing and sometimes ask, how could God let death occur? When in fact what he's trying to do is protect us from something. Because God doesn't want sin to exist in perpetuity. Instead, what God did was made a way for us to be redeemed, for us to be saved, for that spirit to become alive again so we could have a relationship with him. And that's only found in Jesus Christ. So the question then happens, or, or, or is brought up, what exactly happens to us when we die? Let's look at the Christian first. 
Many of you know the story of the rich man and Lazarus. This is found in Luke chapter 16. And the story in a nutshell is this. Um, Lazarus was a beggar. He was poor. Uh, Lazarus uh, did not have a lot of wealth, and every day was a struggle to him. But Lazarus had something very important. You see, he had faith. And he had faith in the Messiah. He had faith that God would save him. And he knew in his destiny, and he put his trust that God would save him. But there's a comparison, too, of a rich man who was trusting in his riches. He didn't have this kind of faith. He thought that his wealth or his power or his influence was enough to get him through whatever he needed to. So we know from Luke 16, 22, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar, that being Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. A very interesting analogy. Lazarus dies, and he's carried him by these angels into what was referred then as Abraham's bosom. It's paradise. Today we don't have paradise. Jesus led captivity captive. Now we go into heaven. But the analogy is still the same. As in other words, he was brought into this eternal state of bliss. Paul, the great apostle, writes that he would prefer to live, excuse me, prefer to die rather than live. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because he had seen heaven and he understood that that was a better place to be than in earth where there's pain and sin and suffering. Paul also writes, it's very interesting, and confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Again, a reference to the part of James we looked at before, that when we die, our body, our outward being falls, but then we stand in the presence of God. And the wonderful thing is God will eventually give us a new body one that doesn't corrupt, one that doesn't get sick, doesn't get old, doesn't need a facelift. Think about that. No Botox. And it'll never be corrupted. It'll be sinless. This is exactly what God wanted. So what else happens to the saved person? Well, the Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. There is a judgment for believers, you know. It's called the beamer seat. And what happens is we stand before God and God judges us for what we've done in our flesh as a Christian. And what we've done to glorify ourselves, or as a term is in our flesh, gets burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. But the things we've done for the glory of God, it's preserved like gold and silver and precious stones. And what happens is we're given rewards, crowns that we throw at the feet of Jesus to thank him for the eternal redemption that we have. So that's what happens to the saved person when he passes away. But the question comes in, well, what happens to the unsaved person? That's a completely different story. Let's go back to Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. We saw what happens to Lazarus, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died also and was buried. That's it. He's died and he's buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. His next conscience appearance is in hell, in torment, in a place of suffering. You may say, well, what did he do to deserve that? It's what he did. It's what he didn't do. He didn't receive Christ for his salvation. You see, the rich man had the opportunity, if he wanted to, to have his sins forgiven and put his faith in the Messiah like Lazarus did. But this man didn't. He put his faith in himself. Revelations chapter 20 talks about the great white throne judgment. If you indulge me just a few minutes, I'm going to read a couple of verses and then we'll talk about it. Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 11, it reads, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And those 
and there was found no place in them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. The death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So what happens to the unsaved? You know, again, the same verse applies. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. So what happens to the unsaved when they die? Well, first they land in hell and then eventually they stand before God at this time which we refer to as the great white throne judgment. And there they are judged according to their own merit. Now this is an important thing that I hope I can bring across to you. Do you see it's not evil or wickedness that God decides people will go to hell? It's because he's giving them a choice. What does it take to get to heaven? It takes the absolute righteousness of God. God is pure and holy. He can't have sin in his presence. If you're going to get to heaven, you must have his righteousness. Not your own, but his. The only way we can obtain that is through Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that God... <clears throat> excuse me one second, please. God hath made him sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We give God our sin. He gives us his very righteousness. That's the whole point of Jesus Christ. So God gives us a choice. He says, look, I will let you stand before me in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, or you can stand before me in your own righteousness. Now, something amazing happens when you trust Christ for salvation. First of all, your spirit becomes alive. But also, you inherit the very righteousness of God, of Jesus himself, so that when God sees you, he sees Christ's righteousness, and he can say, enter into my rest. But if you choose to reject that and don't receive Christ for salvation, you choose to stand before God in your own righteousness. In other words, you say, I think I'll trust in myself. I'm not a bad person. I've never killed anybody. I'm not that bad. I'll take my chances. And God says, fine, I will let you do that. But if God looks at you and sees your righteousness, all he sees is filthy rags. The Bible says all a man's righteousness is what? What's the rest of that verse? Filthy rags. Exactly. Because that's how holy God is. So it really is out of God's love that he gives us the choice to accept him or not. I told you this would be a quick message. But it's not over yet. You know something? If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, maybe you've never heard God's plan of salvation, I'd really like to share it with you because I'd like you to understand it. You would be deceiving yourselves to think that you haven't done anything contrary to the wishes of a holy God. We all know we're imperfect. We just don't realize how bad it is to be imperfect. God requires his very righteousness, and there's no way we can obtain it. So God made a provision for us. Remember we talked about how God displays himself in three persons, one God, three very distinct characters, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That Son aspect of God came down from heaven and took on a body of flesh 2,000 years ago, the promised Messiah. And he suffered, and he died, and he bled on the cross of Calvary to pay for your sins and mine. Jesus had no sin, so he could become the perfect sacrifice. And by dying on the cross, he chose to take our sin. And all he asks us to do is simply put our faith and our trust in him. And something amazing happens when we do that. That spirit which is in us, which is dead, suddenly becomes alive. We have that fellowship with God. I remember when I got saved. I was a kid. I was 14 years old. I didn't understand it, but I knew that when I received Christ, I could sense the very presence of God in my life, and suddenly my perspective changed. That's what happens, and that's what God offers to everybody. 
And the moment you receive Christ, you inherit his very righteousness. So that when you do stand before him, and you will stand before him, he sees Jesus and not you. And he calls upon everybody to simply ask for salvation, to put their faith and their trust in him. That if you do this, you will be saved. That was a promise God gave us. And there are many, many scriptures that tell us that. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation belongs to God, and he gives it to us freely for those who believe in Jesus. The only alternative is to simply say, well, that's fine, but I don't want to do that. I want to stand before God in my own righteousness. And you do so at your own peril with this very stark warning. You're not good enough, and I'm not good enough. And that may sound cruel, but that's the truth. So what about the Christians? Maybe you've been saved for a while, and maybe you, know, you think you're just going to skate through life and meander into heaven and that's where you spend all eternity. Yeah, you will. And God's not going to judge you for your sin. He's going to let you into heaven. But when you stand before him in what's known as the beamer seat, are you going to be receiving any reward? Will you have anything that you can give to Jesus for all he's done? Remember, whatever we've done in our flesh that doesn't bring God glory, it all burns up. God gives us that choice too. See, there's a character of God that's pretty amazing, and that's free will. He loves us enough to give us the choice to decide what we want. So really, it's not because God is mean or angry that people go to hell. It's because he loves us enough to give us the choice. I am going to bow in a prayer. And if there's somebody that doesn't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, I ask that you follow me, that you follow me in prayer. Father in heaven, I come before you as a sinner. Lord, knowing that I can't save myself and I know that someday I will die and I will stand before you. And I know, Lord God, that this blip on earth is, is, is not what it's all about that there is an eternity and I want to spend it with you and I believe that you sent your son to die for me. Lord, I put my faith and my trust. I receive him and I claim your promise, which is now I inherit heaven. Lord, save me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that, I would love to know. That'd be a wonderful thing. And if you're not, if you are already saved, you know, think about this. Think about where we are in society. Look at where our world is. Do you realize we were once a Christian nation? As in other words, we defined ourselves by Judeo-Christian principles. And then over the years, it, it decreased 80%, 70%, 60%. 60%. Right now, polls will say that 4% people espouse Christian beliefs. 4% of the population polled. That's pretty astounding. But I think it speaks volumes and explains what's going on in our world today. How we've chosen to look at things from a very jaunted perspective. I mean, just in the 60 years that I've been alive, uh, I've seen declines in our nation. Morality, you know, the view of life, marriage. Things that you never would have accepted years ago. We now accept as a norm. Ask yourself this one question. Is God pleased? We have an obligation as Christians because the only hope this world has is Jesus. That's it. And we have a message that we've been entrusted with and that is that Jesus died for the sins of the world. You can't make anyone accept it, but you can tell them. I mean, how simple is it to leave a tract at a restaurant? Again, you know, there's an old adage, Jesus is a gentleman. He always was. Read the Bible. He never forced anybody. He never forced himself on anyone. But if they chose to receive him, he was there. The Bible says, how should they know except as be a preacher? You've got to tell people that's your responsibility. Can you imagine standing before God, never sharing the gospel with anyone? What's your life going to look like? Let's close in prayer.
Dear God, as we, as we think about eternity, Lord, we know that our life is nothing. It's, it's this blip in time, Lord. You tell us in your Bible that it's as a vapor. Father, help us to get a, get a glisp of eternity. Help us to look at things from an eternal perspective, not just, not just this time. And Lord God, we pray that you would help us to have a vision of the lost and that we would have a burden to share your word graciously and with love. And Lord, for anyone that doesn't know you, we pray that you would just prick their hearts and they'd think about this and they would turn to you for salvation because in you only is their hope. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.